So here what I want to do is just give a really quick overview of some of the things we know about seed systems for smallholders. And to be right up front that the focus in this workshop is going to be on smallholders. Okay, so smallholders who are also in the middle of nowhere. Okay, why, why are we interested in seed? Well, the first is that seed is the entry point for vulnerable populations. It could be in a disaster. And these figures are really kindly shared by, by FAO. What you see in a six-year period, 97 to 2003, FAO's budget, you all know the UN FAO, okay, increased, so it's, what's this, a six-year period increased sevenfold. And this is 2008 in response to the food security crisis. FAO alone had projects in 48 countries. And then these, I think, are the most current on FAO in 2011. Mostly seed alone is about $750 million. So seed in high stress is big business. And I'm sure most of you know right now, particularly in southern Africa, huge emergency seed. Southern Africa, eight countries, Ethiopia scaling up again. Countries like Ethiopia have had seed aid since 1974, so 40 years. Okay? So seed and the vulnerable are key for us. The second thing is that some of you in the room, seed and commercial development. I don't know if you've seen this, but the commercial sector, mostly maize and horticultural seed, is 32 billion a year. Okay. So the question is, is this commercial sector serving smallholder farmers? The third main reason is that seed is the way that we move innovation, move new genetic material. So it's the way we move um, nutrition, resilience, income. The problem, of course, is across Africa, Mostly, the varieties that are moved are maize and horticultural seed, maybe groundnut. Okay. So in seed, we have emergency, vulnerable, we have a huge amount of money, and we have innovation. It's a really interesting input. Uh, just to be very clear, a vibrant commercial sector does not mean that new varieties will move. I'm really glad you're here from the World Bank. I'm so happy to see you. Also, a vibrant commercial sector does not mean that smallholders will be reached. So in this group here today, let's just be very honest. What can we do, what we can't do? And then finally, the second thing is that I want us to keep in mind our clients, poor farmers, maybe drought-prone zones, maybe nutritionally malnourished. There are different client groups within smallholders. Women, women, men, who are the client groups you're trying to reach? OK, um, what are the types of seed systems that presently exist? I know some people know seed, some people don't know seed. Well, conventionally, we normally say that there's a formal seed system. And that's, you've seen this diagram probably. That's this red band. And that's modern varieties. You sometimes call them improved, but they may not be better, but they're modern varieties and certified seeds. Okay? So the formal system, generally, you have the government doing that. You have commercial companies. And many of the relief agencies only deal in formal seeds. Okay? But then you have what's sometimes called an insistu. And it's funny. It's called informal system traditional, local, farmer, it's all the same thing. And in there you have bone stocks, exchange, like social barter, and, lo and markets, local markets. Okay. If you look at these cylinders, each of these is an action zone where we can make a difference. Right? So you often just think commercial sector, <laughs> But maybe we can make a great difference by improving own stocks. Think about them as action zones. Here I just want to highlight that markets, you often think about commercial markets like agro-dealers. 
farmer and farmer, farmer organizations. But often there are also these local markets where farmers get seed. Just to be clear, in the informal market, not all grain can be sown. But some of the grain is very good seed. And then farmers search it out. They search out what's adapted, what's good quality, and we call this potential seed. Okay, so we have two kinds of parallel markets going on. We have a formal market, and then we have informal markets. Then I want to highlight, many of you work on these funny integrated systems. So they're not formal. They're not informal. So they're community-based systems, farmer co-ops. Any of you ever heard of local seed businesses of ISFC? Yeah. Okay. Private seed entrepreneurs. And what's interesting about these integrated systems is that some of them tie here to the formal sector. So some of these integrated systems try to go for certified seed, for instance. But some of these integrated systems are linked to the informal so they want to maybe not, maybe not, maybe local varieties with quality seed. So there are many different variations that we really need to try out. Okay, so these are seed systems, various kinds of seed systems, various kinds of terminology. Key in, in when we think about seed systems is what do we want to get out of it beyond seed? So do we just want quickly to deal with an emergency problem, link release for development? Or do we want seed systems just for commercial sector and value chain? So some of you in the room work on value chains. This is what you're thinking about. And that's a few crops, value chain seed systems. Some of you are interested in seed systems for drought prone areas, for fluctuating climate fluctuating areas. Some of you, and me too, are interested in seed systems to enhance nutrition, et cetera. What's interesting is that when we start to map what intervention, depending on your goal, the seed system issues are very different. So think about you, know, you want seed quality, but for what goal? Nutrition, resilience, think very hard about what is your goal. What is our goal? Um, just to say that if you look at, I just gave some examples of projects. If you look at most of the projects funded in the world, most of them are under this general kind of food security. Oh, I'm doing seed for food security. Um, the US in particular, because it's tied to breeding, is doing a lot of work now on drought tolerance. So this is just drought tolerance maize for Africa, the Wimas, the water efficient maize for Africa. So a lot of the US breeding is situating itself around resilience. There are select projects that go for nutrition. Have you ever heard of Harvest Plus Biofortified? And then there's some that go to value chain. So again, the seed projects depend on the goal, how they're structured, how they're designed. Um, I'm going to go back to this, but in, in your folder, there's a sheet. The table, something that features an interesting seed project. See that? We're going to do this later on, but what I want to highlight is how different one project is from another. And so if you're going for a seed project for nutrition, so go down on the second box. You see where we all are? And we're just starting to develop these frameworks. And anyone who wants to work on these with us is great. So if you're looking at nutrition, for instance, you need, look at the second column, um, you, need, you need good agronomic traits that have to yield, right? But the germplasm also has to have a high micronutrient content, right? Good things, good iron, whatever. But what's really different is if you're doing nutrition, and I'm glad there are information people here, your strategy is not just, 
posters, field days, um, agricultural extension. You need a marketing strategy that helps the farmer see nutrition, see what's invisible. So depending on your goal, and we'll get back to this again, the seed system will be designed differently. So again, as we're talking about seed systems this morning and seed issues, you're going to have to make strategic decisions. Which channels to support? What goals? Who's your target? Do you just want to reach um, good production zones? Or do you want to try to reach millions of farmers? So what is your target and what are you trying to move? Are you just trying to move a modern variety? Or are you trying to move certified seed? Or are you trying to move both? So start to think as we go forward. Okay. Where are the smallholders in the world? Yeah. Sorry. Back to that last, sure. Could that you say last your name is you? Oh, David Hughes. David, I David. Yeah. Um, there's also, as you were talking about nutrition, yeah. there is also the palatability issue. Yes. And there are the farmer preferences for particular varieties. For you know, it's not just for for drought tolerance, for for example. But the farmer wants to know. You know, they have their own demand, and they have their own. Um, preferences for production, so for what they're going to consume, and yep. then what they're going to market. Right. And and so in particular, and that that will then influence yep. what the farmer will. Yes, that's a great point. So maybe we think we're going for a project for resilience, like these drought tolerant mazes. But the farmer might want to market some of these drought tolerant mazes. They may want to eat some of these drought tolerant mazes. So while our projects are often designed as unidimensional, farmers are smarter, right? They're also looking at income and other things. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to just say your first name first so people get to know each other. Yeah. Jenny. Jenny. Can you go back to the last slide. You said you said it a couple of times now. So when you say moving seed, I just want to make sure you mean like getting it from central trading centers and big towns to farmers. Reaching or? farmers. So when you are, it could be that, but when I say moving seed, and that's a good thing, how do we get, what, what are we selling? Right? So when we're moving seed, what is the commodity we're selling? That's what I meant. So this is a very hard thing, and then I want to go on. So are we, are we selling the new variety? So is that our goal, to get out new varieties? Are we trying to sell certified seed? Now, the thing is that many in the business use the term improved seed. Right? Now, how many of you use the term improved seed? I did when I was young. I find it controversial because improved seed means that you're saying that the only way farmers can get new varieties is through certified seed. So we package the two things together. We package the variety together with the seed quality. But in theory, <laughs> the two are very different, and the marketing strategy is different. So um, many of us just use performing varieties, quality seed, and we don't use improved seed. It's kind of a philosophical difference. So let me go on, and then we can have questions at the end. This is the overview. This is not easy. This is a different way of thinking. But let's aim high. OK. Where do smallholders get seed they plant? Okay. Where do they get it? So we have all these channels. You saw those loops. Any of you can have this presentation. You can have the diagrams, anything. OK. Well, we have the largest data set in the world. And when I say we, it's, um, it's 25 organizations that together collect so there's no one bias. It's UN, it's governments, it's the NGOs. We're in it together. And when I reported this, there were 9,000, almost 10,000 observations. There are now almost 20,000 observations. 
So this is this is big, a big data set. It's a surprise. Where do smallholders get to feed they sell? So this is the result. First, two percent of the seed that smallholder farmers sow comes from the commercial formal sector. Okay. So this is published, you all can see this. All, all the groups that we're supporting, whether it's the US, whether it's Gates, of course Monsanto, the companies, national governments, basically the formal sector, and that's two percent of what farmers sell. The big surprise here is that over half, about 51% is from local markets. There is no official support in terms of our implementation for local markets. None. Interesting here also as a strategy is that 30% of the seed is saved. So everyone says, you know, oh, smallholder farmers, they always save all their seed. Right? They're self-sufficient. It's 30%. You know, these are real numbers. And then in the 17% is a real mix. So it's community-based, it's other stuff. Community-based is about 1.7%. So all of us NGOs who keep on saying, oh, yeah, do community-based, it's about 1.7%. So this is basically a call for action. I can give you the article. It goes crop by crop. But where we're investing is not having any impact yet. Just put it out there. This is a bit more refined. This just shows back here. So this local market is particularly disturbing, or opportunity, an opportunity, is that on the local market is where you get the range of crops. So you who are interested in Brazilian, it's at the local market. You can get the cassavas. You can get the legumes. You can get the cereals. That's the open market. Going back here, this 2%, what is this mostly? Maize. 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 <laughs> Somewhat vegetable seed, sometimes value chains, but 2% is very limited crops. This local market is a range of crops. You can even sometimes get cassava cuttings, just to be honest. It's not common. The other thing that's a real surprise for us is that if you're interested in nutrition, you're probably interested in legumes. And you guys know what legumes are, like soybean, cowpea, bombada, uh, groundnut, pigeon tea. Legumes, about 99% is local market. Okay. So this just goes by country. This here is agro dealers. So across the board, for the whole group of legumes, it's less than 2% comes from formal sector. So let's look at crop profile. This is just to show gender issues. We do think about gender. Where people access seed. This shows for May. So we all love maize. So this is maize in two countries in Africa that have the most developed agro-dealer system. Right? So Malawi, Kenya, we could have had South Africa. We have these two. And what it basically says is that farmers get from both agro-dealers and local markets. Right? But that local markets, which are the red, are more important for maize than agro-dealers. Surprise. And that when you start to look at gender, women use local markets more than use agro dealers more. So both sources are important, but even for the most commercial crop, there are a few surprises. Nothing we're saying is negative. What we're saying is how do we expand the performance of each sector? Um, here is the good news, what I wanted to put all you. OK, so how did farmers get their seeds? What is the means? And there's lots of different means. You know, They can save it. They can exchange it. They can give it a gift. They can buy. This is seed aid. They can do seed loans. They can plant food aid. They can get money credit. There are lots of ways they can access it. What's huge is that over the half the seed is bought by cash. So 54.6% is bought, which means there's a huge buying power that we're not catalyzing. It's such, you know, it's such
such an exciting market, but we're not getting it. Then finally, oops, the last one here, new varieties. People are interested in new varieties. You know, scientists, land grant universities, I used to work for the CGIAR, new varieties. How do farmers get new varieties? Okay. This was new varieties the last, the, last, uh, the last five years, any variety. Well, it's a bit of a shocker, right? So 68%, about 70%, is from government or NGOs. Free, one off. So our strategy for getting new varieties out is give it, free, one off. Some comes from agro dealers, new varieties, mostly maize horticultural crops. Some comes from the local market, that 14%. But this again, this is an area we need to improve. How are we going to market and get out new varieties on a sustainable basis, not free? Yes. Yeah, I just want to say one thing on the 68% here. Yeah. Um, it, it's really become common, I've heard from so many implementers, that that 68% is probably the biggest blockage yeah. because of the, the donor, the gimme. You know, you're there, you're in the community, you're handing out the seeds, you're testing everything, but they know that, okay, this project, all projects, come and go, some more will come, and, you know, technology adoption really is constrained by that factor. You know, that they, sure, will come cooperate with you while you're with us, but, you know, they know that eventually somebody else is going to come along and give them seed and everything. Yep. <clears throat> give them seed and give them a modern technology where there was a, there was a property right that went in there, right? And there was, and they just give it free one off. And to be honest, it's escalating, not decreasing. So right now, right now in Ethiopia and you guys in eight countries in Southern Africa, we're starting to see emergency aid as the way you get out modern varieties. It's crazy. Yeah. Is it CP or CP? CP. CP, fine. Yeah. Does that uh, NGO government assistance, does that include vouchers or just direct distribution? This, this, includes, this includes both. Yeah. So anything that was an assisted... Um, transfer, whether it's vouchers. Vouchers are fairly small in the world. There are a few places. But, but this is, it's, what kind of business hinges on free, except right now the seed business? And when we start to discuss some of these challenges, it's crazy the kind of environment we're trying to work in. Okay, so basically what I want we, us to discuss today is that if you want to strengthen seed systems for smallholders, yes, we have to work with formal markets. And we have to do it better. But that's mostly maize horticultural seed. Obviously, we're going to have to find a way to strengthen these informal systems because, lots of reasons, they're the heart of the seed supply. They are by far quantitatively the most important. Their diversity, if you're talking about resilience, they're the nutrition crops, and they're the way we get out new varieties sustainably. People buy new varieties from the local market. And then we have to look at integrated systems, but these integrated systems are just too variable right now. So we have to think which integrated system works best for what. How many of you, welcome, how many of you work on integrated systems? Like, um, you know, do you have, have you heard of integrated seed sector development or community-based systems for quality seed? or private entrepreneurs. How many of you have any experience in, welcome, in these integrated systems? Bill has a lot. You too, maybe more. Well, we're going to talk about all of these, and they're all action points. Nothing is off the radar here. OK. Um, so we, how, you know, looking at these three, and you know, it's not just an NGO or government, we're going to intervene in all three of these. And let me just give a few examples. We have others we're going to do in a moment. So the formal sector. Well, the formal sector, there are agro-dealers. You guys know, like, farmer cooperatives, agro-dealers. This one, I think, is from Malawi. The people that from Malawi. But there are few crops and few, and few legumes. Um, this is mm -hmm. just an example. Yeah, I don't want to get ahead of you or whatnot, but eventually, I mean, something in that, if you go back to the formal sector, yeah. Yeah. 
and, and just because of your site in Malawi, I mean, there are, are countries in Africa right now where there's a lot of national seed companies. You know, yeah. They're not, you know, and, and they see this window for investments into the legumes. I mean, you know, there's even talk in you know, Malawi about orange flesh sweet potato, you know, commercializing um, you know, access to, to cuttings and such. But <clears throat> there's a growing market. I think they're going to play a huge role in seed sector development of you know, it's not the big international, you know, the Monsantos. It's the national seed companies. But the national seed companies are struggling. They're probably subsidized. But nonetheless, they see that window. Smallholders like the legumes. They're always producing seeds of those varieties for the legumes being for cell power and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I think they'll play a bigger role, and I'm not sure we'll talk about it. Yeah, we are going to talk about it. And the national is. seed companies yeah. are yeah. major development. Things but here are not static. So let's, let's cite the trend. And particularly what's not static is policy. So those of you people who are working on policy, speak up. You know, is it enabling? Could it be more enabling? I just want to give an example here on agro-dealers. Yes, we should support agro-dealers. But this is a, a geographic mapping, um, GIS mapping of agro-dealers in one drought-prone area of Kenya, just to give an example, called Nzawe. And what you find is everyone says, so, yeah, go to the agro dealer. But in this drought prone zone, um, I should have put in that way, excuse me, only a quarter of farmers are in one hour walk of an agro dealer. So agro dealer placement is in higher potential areas. So one thing you can do if you want to work with agro dealers is just increase, help increase the outlets right, into really drought prone zones. Very practical, and this was just the modeling that we could add one new agro dealer and reach 38% of farmers. So strategically think about agro dealer placement. Just going to give a few examples. Another that I really like. This is Mercy Corps, so I'm happy to be hosted by Mercy Corps. This is stuff that Mercy Corps was doing in Timor Leste, and they were saying, okay, why do we need an agro dealer? Why can't we sell seed in the shops that farmers use? So this happens to be a liquor store, right? It's a liquor store. And they have a vegetable display. And this is high quality seed, packaged, labeled, but in a store where farmers go. The Mercy Corps has pioneered this. These are just examples. Informal sector examples. Um, why don't we work more in storage? No, so if 30% of the seed is kept, why can't we get 50% there's no loss? People think, oh yeah, storage, that's really low level, that's really NGOE. But storage is such a strategic investment if it's done well. So much like both seed and grain storage. Here, you guys have seen these metal tins. Another thing that, oops, I work a lot on, you know these pig beds, right? So this is a triple bag, very good for resilience. And my organization, my organization works on pigs now in 15 countries. That's because they think it's so strategic. You all know what a fixed bag is, you non seed people? Well, what it is is a bag, three bags together. You put the seed in the bag, you tie the other two up, and it suffocates the insect. So no pesticides, one investment, you know, a, a bag, and these guys die on their own. Smallholders love them. And smallholders like them a lot. We're working on them by a chain. But I don't want to sell one technology. I just want to say that a simple technology can bring in millions of dollars. Okay. Um, other thing on the informal system, so you can help farmers store better. <laughs> Why aren't we working with traders? You know, traders who go in the middle of nowhere. Okay. So Agro, Monsanto, Syngenta, DuPont, national seed companies, you think they want to go to Kivu? They don't want to go to Kivu. They don't want to go to northern Mali. They don't want to go to parts of southern Malawi, right? So who goes there? This is something, anyone who want to work on this, these traders, like in Ethiopia, they regularly move 200 to 500 metric tons, right? They're big scale. How can we link to traders who already go there? And I know there's these policy issues. This is a real opportunity. And then just on integrated, we could work on local seed businesses. That's where Gates used to put money. Community-based that Bill is very interested in. 
pharma cooperatives. There are lots of input opportunities at different parts of the chain. Um, just central in all of this is that we look at the economic cost benefits, not just we like it, but you know, is this really going to work? And those of you who are interested in doing some of these economic models, we have very good frameworks. Um, and then that we don't assume there's just one way. So you always have to scale up the foundation to greet your feet. That's, and no matter what we do, we're going to have to do this. But then beyond that, there are multiple different trajectories we can go. And what's interesting about this model here is that normally, and this is real data, normally to move a variety to a certain level, so this is 20% of the population, you know, to get this variety out, maybe depending on the variety, it might take 14 to 20 years. Right? So it's a very slow diffusion process. But if you take multiple entry points and you start to add them out, we can start getting many varieties out in a, I would say, in a four to six year period. You get much better coverage. I think that's it. Um, and then I'll show you this website later. There's a website which we have lots of information on. Um, but there's nothing but opportunity here if you're open. If you're open, you're willing to take risks and you evaluate it. Uh, summary, I think we're way underachieving. So I like, I, Bill, I like that you say seed companies are doing great. But if you look at the global situation, right now we're reaching relatively few farmers. Um, some options I think can be tested right now and evaluated. And you're going to talk about that in a moment. But we need to move away from a single strategy to say this works to a multi innovation um, so wake up. Okay. Any questions before we do something fun? Yeah. On that last, on that last um, pie chart, yeah. have you looked at the price differential yeah. between maize seed that is bought in the local market versus maize seed that is bought through agro input fields? Yeah. So when you, good question. Good question. So. We've done a lot of work, but more new work on price differential. What has not been looked at systematically is cost, quality, performance, risk. So let me put this. So the cost of the seed in relation to the quality you get, like certified versus QDS, quality declared seed versus the performance, versus the risk. So we're having a webinar, just you know, AgriLink, on February 28th, looking at quality declared. But you should know in the world, there are one or two examples of certified versus QDS. Do you all know what QDS is, quality declared seed? The second grade of seed sanctioned by FAO, quality declared seed, which costs less to produce. So there are different grades of seed. They're certified, quality declared, farmer truthfully labeled. Um, you have in Latin America and Haiti, artisanal seed by farmer groups. And then you have farmer's own seed. But there are no cost comparisons. Isn't that crazy? So, so, so the commercial sector says, you buy my certified seed because that gives you the best product. But there are no direct cost comparisons, certified, quality declared um, benefits. So for bean seed, for instance, certified seed normally costs four times what market seed costs. But the yield gain is not four times. Okay. For those of you who are recommending different qualities of seed, David, Get the data. If you want farmers to use QDS or certified, is the yield gain commensurate? Seems pretty basic to me. Yeah. I mean, Do you know that? Have you done that? I, I haven't. I oh. haven't done it that way. Oh. But no. Yeah. But the key for me is what is the market for the farmer for that for that produce? So for, the, right. for the surplus, and I you know I, I see it comes in under your risk. Yeah. But in, you know, in particularly when we're working in these resilience areas, the market, you know, the market access, you have to find the trader to be able to sell the surplus, and it has to be in a commercial enough volume that makes that gives the incentive 
for, for the trader to come and buy right. that project. Right. So sometimes, exactly, it, it pays to invest in higher quality seed if you have a value chain market. You know this. Right? So that's what you're saying. But in many cases, farmers aren't feeding into a value chain. You have to look. Just look at the price versus the output market versus the risk and the quality. But it's, it's a huge gap in terms of our data set. No, I need to stretch it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, finally, I had this chart. I, I didn't know if it was needed for everybody. I don't know if it's helpful. But just very quickly, many of you know formal versus informal systems, but they're real differences. And I should put integrated systems up. Just I should do that. But I mean, you know there's um, outreach, formal, limited, informal, wide. Varieties, um, formal, this is just generalizations, right, guys? High yielding varieties of major crops. Um, many local varieties, but a range for the informal. Diversity, diversity low, diversity high. Technical quality. Well, formal systems sometimes, right? But you can move certified seed easily. If you move it long distances, it deteriorates. So even certified seed is variable. And of course, informal systems quality is variable. Talk about that. Seed price, you're saying a bit dated, but it depends on the output market. It's high versus low, just generality. Quality of information. Well, if you go to the agro dealer, you can find out about the variety, but that's limited. Most information is passed through informal networks, your neighbor, your local trader. So they're really big differences. So all of these need to be supported. The question is, which will give the value for which crop where? OK. Any questions here? Yes. Um, can you do what is seed? So I want you now to take out there's a, a scratch sheet. Is seed scratch sheet? Did it say? Check it out. Okay, can you, Abby, can you put on what is she? Just a series of slides. Okay. I'm just going to show some photos. Nothing. We're not testing you. <laughs> All you have to say, don't say anything you just write. We'll just go very fast, right? Is this C, yes or no, and why? Okay. I think there are 11 images, so this is going to take 10 minutes. Okay. If, is this C? Just what do you think? Is this C here? Image one. Don't think too hard. Is this C? So I'm, I'm talking about this stuff right here. Is this C? Is this C? Oh, thank you. Better. This seed? This seed? This? It's a bit unfair to you if you don't know the context, but we will get there. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to see any others quickly, or we can start discussing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's start from the beginning again. Can you give me the We're back. <coughs> okay. Is this C? Just say yes. Yeah. How do you know it's C? Package. 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 Package.
interesting as a marketing strategy. They're, they're packaged. What else about it? Selling other places people already go, like a liquor yes. store. It's, well, yeah, this happens to be a veterinary. It's a shop. It's not a liquor store earlier. Yeah, okay. yeah so it's sold in a shop. This happens to be a specialized, this happens to be a specialized, what's called agro-pharmacy vet shop. So this is a specialized input shop. And this is easy. This. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, tell me why. Why do you know, why do you look at that and you say, okay, let's see, I'm going to buy it. Varieties listed, Cico brands. How it's treated seed. It's green, it's treated. So lots of visible signs. It has a company, it has a, a name, it says it's joining maturity, it's green, it's bad, you know, seed go. This is seed. <laughs> you think why do you think it's seed still? Well, I would say first that it, it's it's packaged, blah, blah, blah. I would wonder, looking at the date best used by, if it's not a decade old seed or something. So in that case, I would say I wouldn't recommend buying it. It might not be seed. Right. It might not be good at seed. It might be good at seed. So what's interesting is that it's labeled. No, no store. This is just an open market. Okay. This could be seed. But then I just want to get you in here. This could also be lousy. You know, depending oh, on the yeah. expiration date. Let's be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we always assume that Seedco is great. Seedco, you know, is one of the biggest companies in, in Southern Africa. Um, but here immediately we say, is it good or not? So we have all these, yeah. Oh, sorry. Is there problems with counterfeit seeds? Because that seed sure. kind of reminds me of like the DVDs you buy. Yeah. At the <laughs> fake seed. <laughs> Huge markets now in fake seed. And some organizations, seed companies particularly work on it. Great question. So, um, but fake seed, normally fake seed is an issue for what? Which crop? Maize. So there are lots of investigations now on how to keep fake seed off the market, but it's almost exclusively with maize. Yeah, but she's right. This could be fake. Yeah. And just to add to that, it, it might still be seed, but it's fake seed might not be the seed that you're paying that premium price. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. You know, you think you're getting a drought tolerant variety that's treated in a special way and something that makes it Okay. He, uh, this. It can be seed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you definitely farmer seed seed there. This is as important as labeling. This happens to be Sudan. This is the way that farmers save this particular I think this uh this crop. This is farmer sage seed put aside just for seed. That was yes. again. I would venture to say you probably got two varieties there too. Yeah. The, the lady's got her other variety Separate. she doesn't have as much of and so she's mm -hmm. separating it out. Yep. Okay. Just see. <clears throat> this is Zimbabwe. What do you think this is? And you guys are a disadvantage, you don't do agriculture. It's not fair to you. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. So I venture to say, like a farmer, when they go out into a field saying, okay, I'm going to pick what I'm going to save yeah. versus what I'm not going to save, you look for the biggest and the best, you know, the so hardest plant in the field, seed. and I would say that's what so this is. Right. So circum, yeah, circum so panicle, save for seed, two varieties. This is just as good as seed co-packaging. This. This is seed because if you buy seed at the market, I think this is Zambia, actually, it's kept on the cob. If it's for seed, it's kept on the cob so the farmer can see how many kernels go by cob, where all the kernels mature. If you're selling just maize, it's taken off the cob. So this is labeling that this is seed. <laughs> this, guys? Oh, I just said, and great diversity. And great diversity, yeah. This is seed. And you pay a premium for this. This is kind of hard, so what this is, does anyone see what this is? The care thing. Well, I, um, I think it's like TV, actually. But what's happening is this is a local market. The farmer has sorted out the non-seed. So she's selling her seed to her for a premium. 
She's discarded the non-seed, which she'll use for food. Okay. But this is, again, this is seed. Uh, I'm going to just go quickly. This, little packs at the market of legumes. This is, uh, uh, well, this is common bean, I think. Looks like cow pea. Pigeon pea. This is seed. You, see, yeah, you go to an open market, you see these one kilo bags. This is this seed? Yeah, it, is, it could be. I mean, I, they probably package it for consumption for soup. But you have, to, you have to ask, is this seed, when was it harvested? So this is ambiguous because this looks like, oh, it's in packets. It's in one kilo packets. Of course it's seed. It could be, it could be not. It could be just soup grain. Let's see that. Well, what do you think you see here? Besides, it's a very unappealing picture. Cashew? Uh, I didn't think it's cashew. Kind of, it's cashew, but it's brucate damaged. So these are brucates. This is a close-up. You know, brucate is an insect that goes into the legumes. So this, no matter what it is, it's not seed. Okay, this is the only clear-cut thing I gave you. What about this? Washi. So it's not, it's, it's, this is just coffee beans. <laughs> okay, so, so all of this is to say is that we have these stereotypes about what is seed. You know, we basically, you know, is it packaging, is it the place, is it the quality label, but let's, let's keep open. 